It's good. Thank you, Rich. <clears throat> it's, um, it's an honor um, to be here today. I was telling some of you, um, my grandmother uh, graduated from Wellesley College in 1917, and her housemate was Madame Jean Kaishek. Um, and I have copies of some of her paintings and wartime speeches, but what I'm realizing is my grandmother would be so happy that I could be here today to be mutually sharing, you know, ideas for both of our countries. I'm, before I even start, I just want to um, reflect on just sort of the title. Um, a few thoughts that could be helpful. So um, the term participant direction often goes as consumer direction, self-direction. It goes under many names. I will use often enough participant direction. Long-term services and supports, you know, we've also sort of talked about, the bound, about what does that mean, what's the boundary with post-acute care. But by and large, long-term services and supports are, you know, the types of services people provide for themselves, provide for their families. Um, admittedly, we have found, uh, even in our research, um, which is called this cash and counseling demonstration, that. Over 80% of the home caregivers um, involved in the cash and counseling demonstration were providing assistance with what might be called nursing care, and over 50% of those were providing help with uh, tasks of moderate or high complexity. But again, it's just context. Um, you know, even in the United States, which is viewed as so highly individualistic. <laughs> it's well upwards of 70% of all the supports and services that people, you know, with activity of daily living needs, way upwards of 70% is provided by family. But I've often been amazed watching over years our long-term care survey. I'll, I'll just do a different twist on that. It, it, it stays even in the 60% of all the people with ADL needs that receive only care <laughs> from uh, informal supports. The, the, the proportion in the United States that are receiving some mix is still maybe in the 20 percent. But don't kid yourself, the percentage who can make it on just formal services is, some, is a number you could about count on your hand. So, so I mean, that's that's sort of a beginning as you talk about, um, you know, that's just on the title of the talk. <laughs> um, now, I thought, again, I'd go even further, and I'll do this sort of iteratively and then sort of give you a picture of where I'd like to go. Um, I'd like to talk just a little bit more about what do, we, what do I mean, anyway, by participant-directed services. And then, why? Why would anyone be interested? Um, now, within the way thinking has evolved in the United States, this certainly starts with you know, person-centered planning, which we've talked about. It's a beauty to be one of the later speakers. You can just build on the thoughts that have already been you know, been shared. There are then er, other forms where we'll call it employer authority, where the participant has the major say in who they hire, manage, train, even dismiss. And then the type of participant direction I've been involved with goes even a step further. And the participant, sometimes with their family, is in charge of a portion of the budget and, li and literally has great authority over how and where and why they use it. That's called budget authority. So just setting the context again, 
this, this whole area, I'll go from person-centered planning to uh, maybe it's a continuum, maybe it isn't, <laughs> employer authority to budget authority. Um, in the United States, again, one of the arcane provisions in the Affordable Care Act um, was the Section 2402A, <laughs> um, which required the Secretary of Health and Human Services to issue guidelines that cut across all of the programs within Health and Human Services and deal very explicitly with guidelines for what is going to be expected and measured in the future as far as attention to these options. I think these came out in May or June of this year that sort of give you some more specifics. But I, I have another, um, oh, uh, the gentleman here asked a very nice question, what's your perspective? Um, I, I have such a mix. Um, I, uh, for some years, actually was responsible for the state of Connecticut's home and community-based services where I was a champion of care management types of approaches. But I also have learned tremendous amounts about this whole area by being the father <clears throat> of an adult son with um, developmental disabilities. So when you get into this, I'm just going to try and put meat on the bones of some of this. When you get into person-centered planning, and somewhat even within our communities, the word patient-centered is often used interchangeably, but patient in a sense objectifies someone. <laughs> uh, um, the the, the person-centered planning is really thought of the person, it, it is his or her own goals, visions, plans th that are what emanates out. It's not just that the person's at the center. I can't tell you how many meetings I went to with my son where they started out with a litany of all the things he had done wrong over the last year. Um, I can't tell you how many times someone said, this is the program you're going into, without asking him, without seeing how it fit with what he wanted um, for himself. And even this last IEP, I, I, I had to go all the way to working with our Disability Law Center. Uh, um, not only about he didn't want to be in a group home, but to get included in his individualized health plan some statement of his strengths and accomplishments over the last year. It's amazing how hard it was to get that put into there. Um, so again, this is all just uh, background, but it also shows just a number of the places my own thoughts and, and, and values emanate from. Why? Participant direction. <clears throat> um, the, the origins of um, the, this cash and counseling program, a, a, a demonstration and evaluation that I'll speak of later, um, in, in some funny ways goes back to the Clinton health plan. Uh, in which there was also a small long-term care benefit. People in the disability community championed a person-directed alternative. And this was the type of arguments. It's when I need help with such personal tasks as bathing, transferring, getting out of bed, incontinence, I, I, in the United States, the norm is going to an agency, so I don't have much say on who helps me. I'm somewhat at the mercy of the agency of when I do things. I may have to go to bed at 6.30 instead of midnight when I want to go. Um, the, the agencies have serious restrictions not to, to give life to some of them. It may not be just, uh, I, I can't take you in my car or I can't perform these, these kinds of activities. I, one of them that stuck in my head was a woman with MS that said the uh, agency could come and they could help her with her laundry but not her children's. Um, but you, you, there, there are just numbers of, of, of things where the, the claim, at least for some, and this is an option, I, I myself would probably oppose this if it were the only choice, um, but the option of uh, people saying, if I had more control over my life, I think it would be better, uh, and I think I could do it for the same amount of money, 
or, or, or thereabouts. That's the origin along with, just as you're doing today, um, us doing a scan of what was going on in the world, <laughs> you know, in, in these mid-90s years, the, the uh, attempts in the Netherlands, uh, Germany, so, some other countries of, could this, could this work here? What we've found over the years, and I've had the joy, uh, because of being responsible for this demonstration and evaluation, and then its replication, <clears throat> you know, of actually, with permission, going out and meeting with some of these people, talking to them in their homes. Um, and you start to see real life. Um, one reason is definitely control. Um, I, I, I can picture um, this woman way up into her 80s um, in Arkansas, but what she's basically saying is, I'm the boss. <laughs> um, but we tended to find, even in, when there were options, that people who were more disabled were more likely to choose the, the self-direction. Maybe it's converse. When, when control is less, you want it more. I don't know, but for some people, this ability uh, to, to have the major, they cook the eggs my way, they, um, it, it, it's, it's, for other people it's definitely the flexibility. Um, agencies wanted to deliver blocks of time as opposed to 45 minutes here, there, or at some, um, it's, it's the, um, I'll tailor it this way. If I were talking to the head of an area agency on aging in central Massachusetts, he'd say, where else can I find an approach that I can deal with my Ethiopian community, my Russian community, my... Uh, but the, the point I'm making is we see that people with different ethnic backgrounds use the funds in very different ways. The story is they tailor it to the, the, their own um, way. A third type of reason we weren't expecting, because you think of rugged individualism, <laughs> but it's, it's really often a, a form of reciprocity uh, uh, where the person becomes, has the possibility of being more, um, I, I can do something to help this family member or neighbor who's helped me, or I can get out into the community more. Uh, I, I'm, I'm amazed at stories like, it was an older man in Minnesota in a very rural area who was really just um, not eating, uh, failing to thrive. Uh, when he was able to hire his own caregiver, one of the ideas was, I'll take him to the grocery store 24 miles away, not that they were that many that closer, that's next door to the nursing home where his wife wa was, um, so that he could see her. <laughs> Um, and that, plus him getting the kind of ethnic food that he wanted, seemed, it, it's that community. The, the other part that was central in many states is, is this is one form of dealing with future worker shortages. Um, quite truthfully, when people can draw into the labor market, neighbors, friends, people who would not have been caring but for this person and, uh, Interestingly enough, Ted Benjamin at UCLA has done some work on how many of these people, once they're drawn in, stay as caregivers for others, which is, which is also quite interesting. So, I mean, aside, it, it's a really a matter of just stopping before we start, and why would, why, why would this be a good option? So, what I want to do is three things, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to look at a watch, so stop me when I'm... Um, I, I'd like to talk about, quickly, now, the research base for why you sh this is worth paying attention to. Second, I'll probably be, I want to just raise, if not answer, just a bunch of practical key questions about how does this work and how would I grapple with it and where are their toolkits. And then lastly, and I don't want to shortchange this, I'd like to talk about what are we doing about uh, how does this fit with not just managed care but care integration. Th th those would be the three things I'd, I'd like to do. Okay. Cash and counseling is, is literally the name. It's an awful name, but um, 
that our demonstration and evaluation went under. But there was basically a feeling in the United States in the mid-90s that this idea of, of self-direction, um, it, it was an idea that needed, um, oh dear, less heat and more light. <laughs> it was one of those few areas where perhaps a, a large-scale controlled experiment made sense. Robin Stone was in a very key place at the uh, Office of the Assistant Secretary for planning and evaluation. When this got going, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation was the other initial major sponsor of this. But <clears throat> the, the, the core things to remember about this demonstration were they really wanted it to be a large-scale demonstration. Anyone can find 100 former accountants um, you, you know, who could manage this. So they really wanted this to be involved thousands of people. It, it turned out, say, 6,500 people over three states. Secondly, uh, if you had one chance to test participant direction, you wanted it to be well done and a, and a reasonably strong form of participant direction. So in this case, uh, I'll say more about it, but people literally got control of a budget, um, roughly equal to what an agency would have spent on their behalf. That was our approach. And, and again, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself, but they had to develop a spending plan for how that was going to be used. It wasn't just like an SS, uh, for us uh, uh, a disability check in the mail. Um, thirdly, we wanted to evaluate it in the strongest possible way, so it was a randomized control experiment. Um, and fourthly, a reasonably robust model, it was tested with, um, in each state, um, large samples of elderly people, adults with physical disabilities, and in Florida, children with developmental disabilities. So those are the, the elements of, of the test. Um, each state in the United States is so different in its own way, but the, 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 the core intervention was the same. Um, I, I try for simplicity purposes to you know, put it in a five-step approach, but basically people entered the system just as they always did and received the assessment that was done in that community. Um, the second step sounds so easy, but um, how do you assign a dollar value? I'll get back to that. The, the amount of the budget, how do you assign it? How do you assign it in a fair, transparent, equitable manner? But in this case, a dollar value was assigned to that individual's own care plan. So there was equity at the individual level. Some states did that based on past experience. Some did it on um, cashing out the value of the care plan. Uh, some over time developed algorithms of people with this level of disability and support tend to need this level of a budget. The third step sounds so easy also, and it's not. Um, but it was the, the participant received enough information to make a personal choice, um, often with their family member. But what's enough information? <laughs> um, how do you deliver it? Often people wanted family members present. Uh, often these visits were done at night. Or, or on Saturdays, they were done at times that were convenient for family. But there's a whole history behind each of these simple steps. Um, fourth, the consumer and the counselor developed a spending plan to meet the person's individualized needs. Um, and I'll get back to who's this counselor and, and what's their role, but the uh, the care manager, it's like turning your hat around, becomes a coach. <laughs> um, the way I described it is when my sons were young, I was the case manager, and now I'm at best the coach. Uh, um, but it, but it's, um, 
it's, it's helping, there's so many skills when we get into training of how do you think creatively about your needs, your different circle of friends, how you could meet those needs. But there's a couple of things here. They had to develop a spending plan that was very precise, that was later used to monitor those expenditures. And um, the second thing is the only litmus test, th this gets, I don't know what to say, watered down over time, but the only litmus test was someone had to show that this spending plan will help me remain independent in the community. That's, that was the litmus test. So people could not only use the employer authority of hiring whom they want, including close family, but they could buy assistive devices, they could do renovations for their home, they could buy goods and services, the woman with MS was able to buy a chair that was firm enough that she could get out of it. Uh, um, the, the, the whole range of things were, could be quite totally creative. And th this comes back to our efforts later at integrating health, acute, behavioral. The money could be spent very holistically uh, in terms of the person as a whole person, what would help them, uh, you know, um, remain independent. Maybe it's a computer, a, a, a laptop. Maybe it's a, a microwave that lets me do more of the cooking. Then um, the cash allowance group was provided with financial management and counseling supports and services. They weren't left on their own, and I'll come back to later on when I talk about the practicalities, how that worked. So the original three states are the blue. Uh, Arkansas, Florida, um, and um, New Jersey. The green ones, th this represents at this stage, um, I think I'm going towards 18 years of my life. <laughs> um, the, the controlled experiment went on from like 1999 to 2003. The, uh, then the green states, we were able to do a 12 state replication uh, within Medicaid, and it led to a couple of pieces of federal legislation that let every state do this. But what were the types? Um, what were the types of findings? And and here are, you can read all these, and I, I've brought lots of materials, but I, I just want to capture things. So here's a key to reading these: we sep we analyze things separately by. Um, let's see if I can figure out by Arkansas, Florida, and New Jersey. Um, we analyze non-elderly separate from elderly, separate from children. You can see the treatment of the people who manage their own budget. The control stayed with agencies. Um, asterisks represent statistical significance. The more asterisks, the higher, lower or higher the level of statistical significance. Um, but this is one of the most important slides of all. Um, it was just a question at nine months asking people, did you receive personal assistance services in the last two weeks? And, and this re relates back to something Dr. Bieber uh, you know, mentioned even in his first slide. So take a look at Arkansas. When people managed the money themselves, um, of the elderly, roughly 90, 95% of the people who managed themselves said yes. Only 80% of the people who were going through agencies received any personal assistance services in that two week period. For the non-elderly, more dramatic, just take Arkansas. 95 versus almost just about two-thirds. But this is probably one of the more important aspects of this whole thing. It has cost implications you'll see later on, but it's that the prescribed care is much more apt to get delivered. There were, um, um, oh, I'm, these are all, I'm, giving examples. There were four other types of quality outcomes. Um, one had to do with satisfaction with very particular aspects of your care. Did your worker treat you with respect, come on time? And 
you can just see the size of the differences. Uh, this Randy Brown at Mathematica, who he, he was the pre principal investigator, said he had never in his life seen r results of, of this magnitude. Um, here's another one, but it has ramifications for the long run. I sure wish we could have done a longer term evaluation and follow up. But the reductions in unmet need were equally dramatic. I mean, not that unmet need disappeared, but um, you can imagine that if someone could tailor the money to their own particular needs, it would reduce unmet need. But what are the ramifications of that in the long run? There's a bunch of these. If What if they continued? What would the effects be? We had no hypotheses whatsoever on health outcomes. And uh, let's just say they were 11 health outcomes, um, things like decubitus ulcer ulcers, contractures, um, falls, things like that. Across the seven populations, never, and remember this when we come to talk about other things about training, risk, negligence, never, in no case, did the traditional agency in a statistically significant basis do better, in no case. But in, uh, I think it's a third of the case of these measures, those who managed themselves did 20 to 50 percent better on some of these measures than did people served by agency care. Um, this one about this overall life satisfaction is, <clears throat> in the past, was viewed as a terrible measure because it was so hard to move. <laughs> um, this also was affected, but part of the reason I'm, I'm impressed, part of the reason I'm impressed, and I'm not, hard, I'm not easy to impress, is um, the state of Arkansas, remember every state gave the person what that person would have gotten in that state. The state of Arkansas's average benefit was about $340 a month. And if that improves someone's overall life satisfaction, th then, I, then I paid attention. Um, I'm going to talk more and more later on about the family. But there was a whole aspect of the program uh, of the evaluation, which was very strong, that looked at the effects on the primary caregivers. Um, I think they were, their experience was looked at around eight months after the demonstration had begun. But not only but were they across the board and significantly uh, more satisfied, they had less emotional, physical, and financial strain. Now again, what, I'm, what some of our research is now, we'd love to look at that in a longitudinal way. Does that translate into um, less burnout over time, less turnover of caregivers? Um, there, there's a number of longitudinal items that I'd really like to know much more about. Um, th this one I think is fascinating, but one of the elements of cash and counseling uh, we, we not only then looked at the experience of the workers and compared the experience of the workers the participant hired with agency workers. There you lose the advantage of the full controlled experiment. But in cash and counseling, in these original states, the participants set the wage. The state didn't. Um, and in two of those states, to me not surprisingly, the participant paid more than the agency. Uh, the participant was, once you have a good worker, you don't want to lose that person, is, is, is sort of the argument. Um, they, um, there's also elements not shown here where the participants actually felt as well or better prepared to take care of the person they were serving than the agency workers. Some of the hypotheses there is a lot of agency training maybe either paperwork or generalized, whereas a lot of the training that the, the family or the person, the, the participant chosen worker can go to the home, can be at the physician's office, can be there when the home health agency visits. Um, but these are other things that I'll, I'll say are, need more, more study, need more research. Um, the effect on Medicaid costs, um, in the, I'll say two things here. The original experiment, as you remember, was comparing a whole treatment group with a whole 
<laughs> control group um, in um, in Arkansas, as you'll see, we were lucky enough, I'll look at this one, to be able to capture three years of um, Medicare and Medicaid um, cost data, and we were able to find like an 18% reduction in nursing facility usage. So in, in uh, let's see, I'm going the wrong way. Uh, in Arkansas, we had enough information to know this, even though the, the basic problem was the traditional agency's inability to deliver, the, in many cases, the services. In, in a state like Arkansas, you had this as a break even. The other states, you had modest in cost increases. But this includes the administrative costs for the support brokers and the financial management services, which we feel we've learned ways of streamlining some of those costs. And put it a different way, the, the way most insurance companies and states measure their costs is a per member per month. <laughs> and in those cases, the um, self-directed approach was almost always less expensive. So uh, when you just compared people who got care with people who got care. Um, I'm going to go quickly over the next part so I have some time to talk about the practical issues. Um, we at our National Resource Center for Participant Directed Services, so when the cash and counseling demonstrations ended, we morphed into a National Resource Center. One of the things we do is a a national inventory on the growth of participant-directed programs, the attributes, the number of uh, people participating, how they run. Um, so this is more, uh, you know, a picture of, of the growth. We did this in 2010. We just are about to release the findings from 2013. Um, but basically, at this stage in the United States, every state in the United States has one or more employer authority programs. 43 states, I think it is, have um, budget authority programs. Many of them are new. Most of them are small, um, but new. Um, and yet, you have states, I'll make this hypothesis, and it fits with where you are in Taiwan. <laughs> when you had a state like California, which the culture supported <laughs> uh, self-direction, California has over 400,000 people who are self-directing employer authority in their um, in-home in supportive services program, as opposed to a, con a state, for instance, that had a, 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 a very heavy agency base uh, you know, that they were trying to integrate this into. You have more choices and, and chances, but the culture factor is, is definitely a big one. The other one, I'll, I can't help but think about rural. Some of the places this has worked quite easily are in rural states where there's extant communities and people have an easier time finding family, friends, neighbors. Um, how, how am I doing? Okay, um, I, I'll just then, if, if it's okay, I'll, I'll capture places that are practical issues that I'd be glad to raise with you and talk more about later. Um, Lisa already covered whole areas around setting el eligibility, how do you set the budget amount, what can be purchased, so I won't go there. The supportive services people want and need, we had a very, helpful environment where Robert Wood Johnson Foundation gave us the money to do focus groups and surveys. So we learned at great length what helped people. People wanted not the money, but a way to keep track of the money. Uh, but we learned a lot that way. Um, registries of workers can be helpful if people don't have ready-made. We learned a lot about people, who, say, with Alzheimer's or developmental disability. Um, what, how do you think about someone's ability to appoint a representative? Who can help them? What kind of training and support do representatives need? We've been doing uh, qualitative studies in Arkansas of uh, people with dementia who are playing this the, the role for family members. Um, 
who can manage? <laughs> Um, that is a good is, is a good question. How do you handle risk assessment? There are whole now best practices to negotiate with participants. There is um, actually uh, developed by researchers here in Ohio a whole guide to quality in consumer directed services, which gets into monitoring CQI standards, mitigating against fraud and abuse. I'd love to talk about the training needs. Um, family substitution effect, I should say at least something about. People worry so much about um, will the family caregiving go away? <laughs> I, I, we couldn't possibly afford to pay for, for all of it. Um, I, I'll just say a couple of things. One of them was, believe it or not, in the state of New Jersey, the amount of informal care that people provided went up, not down. <laughs> After the, the caregivers who were paid continued to provide hundreds and thousands of hours of unpaid. Um, so the only thing then is we get to care integration. I, I do. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, um, but all of these very practical issues are the, are the details of what makes a program, you know, work and, and work well. Say we now focus on the future. I, I'm not sure if this would be the same in Taiwan, but AARP's surveys of their members, what if in, when you need help bathing dressing in years to come, would you like to go through an agency or manage it yourself? This is at least um, important in our case to be able to think that way. Some of the things going on here that have important relevance for the future, this, I'll, I'll take these from the bottom up. Opportunities with new populations and, um, and, and service arenas. We, our, our largest single contract right now is with our Veterans Health Administration and, and helping to develop this Veterans Directed HCBS, particularly started not just for the number of aging veterans, but um, people returning from current wars who were not feeling well served. We're actually in our latest contract to work with the VA on how this could be adapted for TBI. Um, behavioral health. I'll, I'll just say this as we plunge towards integrated care. When we reanalyzed the cash and counseling data for SAMHSA, we found that in each state, somewhere between 18 and 24 percent of the participants had behavioral health claims on their Medicaid uh, records. So we actually, starting August 1st, are involved in a new seven-state um, demonstration and evaluation of self-direction in behavioral health. There have been small demonstrations, controlled experiments, maybe with only 150 people or so, in southeast Pennsylvania and in um, the Dallas, Texas, and in the UK. Um, but this is to try and look uh, across New York, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Florida, Texas, Utah, and Oregon, um, and to try and look at how this works, and in some cases how it works as they're integrating uh, uh, behavioral health into a, you know, an integrated system. Training needs, um, uh, here I'll speak especially for support brokers, um, and, and knowing that Robin will do much better even on, on this topic. We, we found um, the states of Arkansas and New Jersey created a whole new um, system of support brokers. Florida tried to use existing care managers and um, three months into the demonstration, we had almost no one had signed up. Um, and we ended up doing focus groups with both the case managers and the supervisors, and it's led us on a long trek of how much of a paradigm shift this is moving from a medical model 
uh, per, you know, the professional knows best to one of understanding your own uh, comfort with risk, <laughs> your own feelings of is the participant really able to do this. So um, our latest part is we have a grant with the, the um, New York Community Trust and the Council of Social Work Education to work with nine schools of social work across the country to build into the bachelor's level the training on person-centered planning and, and participant direction. The only things I'll say on in, in, integrated care maybe and managed care, maybe three and then I'll stop. Um, here's another place where philosophy uh, clash. I, I, I can remember talking with, uh, and, and in this case, I don't think they'd mind me saying, um, physicians at this Commonwealth Care Alliance in, in Massachusetts, a, a well-known um, nonprofit, and they were saying, how do you mesh the philosophy of managed care and participant direction? Now, now again, and I think even Robin's written on this as far as there's a lot of things about managed care, it's flexibility, uh, et cetera, that would lend itself to this, but it's where's the power? <laughs> but what we ended up doing was saying, no, it's where's the policies and the protocols. So we actually were able with Robert Wood Johnson funding to give them uh, a, a modest grant to develop sample policies and protocols for how do you work this? How, do, how does it work? Does, uh, does the role of the representative change if the person has behavioral health needs and they want to specify in advance? Does the role of the participant hired worker change if with the participant's permission they can feed information on the red flags that affect that? I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that I, I I personally believe it's policies and protocols that would make the difference. Um, in our case, again, which mirrors so much what you're, I think, facing in Taiwan, especially in some of these Medicare, Medicaid integration projects, we have very large managed care corporations who uh, know very little or have very little experience in long-term services and supports, and here they are plunging into that. What do they need to know? Uh, um, what do they need to know about long-term services and supports? But one of the places we actually, um, I, I personally have a strong belief, is despite the best um, monitoring and guidance from federal agencies and states, I guess I have the personal belief these managed care corporations are going to be controlling a great deal of the day-to-day -day working with the participants. So we've just signed our first contracts with managed care corporations to be working directly on the training of their staff and, and the examining of their policies. But um, one of the things you'll find in the handout is for that Medicare Medicaid integration office, we've had contracts looking at um, the first states that moved to managed care, the first MOUs for the duals, and looking at all their policies and procedures. It, it is a time of big change here in the United States, and <laughs> another place we'll be so happy to hear your experience. Um, thank you, Professor Mahoney. Um, I have two questions. One is uh, about the practical detail. Um, in, your, in this uh, participant direction model, um, you mentioned about uh, the consumer will uh, discuss their decision with the counselor. So I would like to know the, what is the, prof is there any particular professional background for this counselor? For example, social worker or something like that. And the second question is about um, because we are talking about personal decision. I wonder um, because people sometimes change their mind. So, what what happened if they decide <laughs> they they decide to change their care plan? And the the other thing is that because the 
the older generation in Taiwan are um, com comparably uh, less educated. So when they're making decisions, especially with family, they might have different op opinion. You know, the person who receive care and the, their family member, or, or even sometimes you have uh, different opinion between family member, and how do you uh, resolve this kind of problem? Thank you. The only place I need help is, uh, what was your first question? <laughs> Background for the oh, counselor. Okay. Um, one of our um, PhDs, recent graduates, did um, a three-state study where she um, just published it, looked at three states and what was the educational background of the support brokers, what training did they receive, what tasks did they re perform, and where did they feel competent or not. And it gives you quite a varied picture. Um, I, you know, so I'm not going to say I, I, I'm certainly not going to say I know the best. Uh, we're trying to more work on the competencies th that are needed. I'll say one thing, um, maybe that goes a little further than I intend to, but among the groups that can have a hard time are social workers and nurses uh, who have been more in the health care professions. The, the argument I use within my own profession of social work is we have a deep tradition of empowerment that goes back to the roots of social work and fits quite well. Uh, um, what if people change their mind? Um, oh yes, that's fine. Um, one of the other parts of the evaluation of cash and counseling was an ethnographic study that followed 25 people in each of the states. And as opposed to just numbers, it tells their stories, it interviewed them, their family, their caregiver. And you'll see life changes. I, life really, I, in fact, I have another group of PhD students who's, in fact, we helped create, I'll get back to this issue, I, I was hoping I'd get to it anyway of participant involvement, not just at the individual level, but in the design, implementation, and evaluation of programs. We've helped spawn a national participant network, and then they've separately incorporated. They're now in 30 states. Um, their biggest research desire was to know what are the long-term effects of managing a budget. So they've interviewed, um, it's, there's two separate studies. One is of youth in transition who had this option. The other is older people. But they've talked to them about their experience over five years. But think of yourself, how much changes in five years? I, I, I mean, but this model has great ability to be, fle to be, fl to be flexible. Um, I'm, the worry of people not being educated can be overblown. When, when we first started cash and counseling in Arkansas, we, as I said, were able to do focus groups and surveys, and we found that, um, gosh, I'm not remembering the exact percentage, but I, it was an amazing number, percentage of the elderly in Arkansas that had less than a sixth grade education. Um, now, 73% of the people who used the option in Arkansas were elderly. Um, but uh, older people were much more likely to want, I don't know if they needed, but to want a representative who could help them manage. And I, I hope I've caught most of your questions. This is uh, Dr. Yu, um, Professor Kevin. Uh, I want a question is you mentioned about the uh, integrated care. I have been practicing here in the West Side here for about uh, 35 years. And I've been actively participating. At that time, I retired about three years ago. I have been serving as one of the officers uh, managing for the, the uh, in integrated. We, we set up uh, integrated with the hospital as well as the private practitioner called IPA. 
Actually, at that time, we took at all the HMO contract and turned into the, the HMO contract turned into integrate because we had a hard time to find a physician willing to participate on the HMO because they just don't too much risk it to them. So therefore, we have to do that. What I do, I sit in the committee in management team as one of the representatives for the physician. I was the chairman of the URQA committee of the management team. And up to six years, we lost almost 1.5 million. And uh, that is a pro pro the, rea re re the reality here in, the, in our midways here. However, I have some colleagues in the California. They have been in the IPA or the group. It sounds like they are successful. They are group and they have a negotiation power. You must be have a group in order to negotiate the price to be coming down. So in, integrated is, integrated is very good. In our setting, we have about 200 physicians. I'm a, one of the six representatives from physician part and administration for, from the uh, Mercy Hospital before it's a community health partner hospitals. This is a, it's pretty difficult. End up to be is nowadays, my colleagues at that time, more about choose to retire. Mm. This is a headache, forget it, get out of it. Now the question is, Chen, time has changed since that now look like uh, nobody wants to be private practice anymore. It's more in the institution now. And the private care, the quality of some not as good. good to, it's a, like a hard, hardware is better institution, but the software is lost. You lost like an integrity that we use to 24 hours contact with a patient. Nowadays it's not. You want to see the doctor? No. You see the nurse practitioner, sometimes good, they call you, otherwise you cannot reach them. Hmm. It's a software without care about the healthcare instead of hardware. Now, how do we get into the situation, the financial situation, budget situation, how do we improve, how to get into the in integrate, or integrate situation with the limited resources? Thank you. I'm, I'm, I, I admit, if I have misunderstood your question, I apologize. Um, the, the, the issue of how to integrate the acute, the, the hospital. Altogether, however, I think it's, uh, time is changing. The physicians are more. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, I, I, won't even, Thank you. I won't even pretend to have an answer, but I'll, I'll, I'll say this, with, again, with this Commonwealth Care Alliance, um, I've been so lucky um, that what I've had the chance to do is go out and s visit, as they did home visits with some of their um, patients, and then to sit on the care coordination meetings with the physician, the nurse practitioner, and, and the different parts. And again, it's trying to understand how you can bring these different points of view together and do it in an organized way th that health systems can implement. That's our challenge. Uh, my comment is after so many years practice, my fear is we needed to bring a law, form, law reform to let the physicians feel comfortable. Otherwise, HMO just don't take, don't work, mm -hmm. never work. Because you force the physician get out of practice. So how we do that? You know, that's uh, the key. Law reform and uh, medical, medical reform, not just pressure. Hospital physicians also have to be law for prevent to uh, the federal lawsuit and the protective medicine, protective psychology is a one cost too much. Thank you.